Hello and welcome back to Continental Club. Happy Christmas Eve, wherever you're watching, guys. Here to bring you some Christmas cheer. I've got Michael McCubbin and Henry Hill. McCubbs, are you feeling Christmassy? Uh, I am actually a bit. Um, Good. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't get to make it home last year for kind of COVID-related reasons, so oh, it's no. nice. I'm back in my kind of family home, and um, so yeah, I'm feeling a bit more, a bit more so this year than last year. It's also why uh, the viewers at home can see uh, the lovely kind of damp stain on the on the bedroom ceiling um, <laughs> and just the general mess that is my, uh, you know, my my bedroom at my parents' house. So um, so yeah, you haven't seen this since I think October. 2020 so yeah big treat big treat it's a throwback for everyone <laughs> love it love it How, henry where are you filming from are you filming with the with the curtains yeah big time uh i'm back in my family home um if anyone who didn't watch eru saw the other day it's it's all right we don't have a christmas tree we have a sort of instead of a christmas tree this year dad's got a load of old dyed old wood which has died and just hung oh, loads nice. of stuff on it i can't i've not explained that very well at all it looks quite cool but uh, it sounds very green i like that yes no no it's a bit of an alternative christmas here this year but yes yeah, good i was just wondering though before we uh kick off did both of you see ac and inter milan's new stadium design the cathedral i haven't Beautiful. Actually, no. cathedral. Oh, what did you think of it henry it looks very similar to bordeaux stadium that is what Ooh. i was thinking but it looks pretty i mean if they were going to make it it was always going to be beautiful, I think. Yeah. And I, it does look like it's going to deliver. I was reading about it in terms of how environmentally friendly it's going to be. It's going to be in a big park and it's going to be sort of state of the art in terms of the way that it uses energy, etc. So that's really cool. When's so, it when's it due yeah. to, when's construction due to start? Because I know we were discussing as a as an EFD team about the idea of going to the San Siro at some point before it gets knocked down. Uh they did they didn't say they said they've got to spend the rest of the year sort of finalising certain okay. details. But it does look, it looks pretty cool. And it means we're going to have to accelerate our plans. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. absolutely. We might be able to get that out there for, a, I don't know, a Serie A decided for uh, the end of the year, <laughs> maybe in May or something. That'd be I'd epic. be absolutely on that. Um, but yeah, I put on Twitter how, how much I just thought the stadium looked really cool and how I thought it was great news for Milan because I wrote that EFD explained on how Maldini resurrected mm. Milan. And one of the things I said at the end was they do need to change the San Siro. It's, cr it's crumbling. You know, it's not going to be at its best state in, in 20 years time and and the fact that revenue from their stadium that they bring in is only 30 million euros per year which is compared wow. to stadiums like you know the top stadiums around europe they bring in almost 100 so they're losing 70 million every year which could be spent on new players or improving their training ground etc mm -hmm. on their stadium so hopefully the cathedral brings inter and ac into the into the modern age really it was a bit it was a bit of a shame Juventus as well like changing their stadium 10 years mm. ago re refurbishing that that kind of went hand in hand with them becoming you know becoming a force once again so it definitely is there is a lot to be said for it yeah absolutely so we'll see what happens there but yeah I uh, put that on Twitter and then Menez instantly replied being like I'm not gonna not gonna get too excited until there's a spade in the ground because there's been lots of talk about this uh, this stadium for years and yeah there's been lots of false dawns with it as well so we'll see what happens there but yeah, just to conclude our introduction, I'm also at my mum's house, hence the slightly strange, boring background. Uh, no tartan curtains in the background this time. Anyway, let's get into today's show because we've got a belter of an episode. Isak Krishnan sent in a question said, saying, who is the most underrated player of 2020 well? Well, Isak, we're not going to just do the most underrated player. We're going to create an 11 of the most underrated players of this year. And I think it should be an absolute belter of an episode. Let's kick off with goalkeeper. McCubbs, why don't we start with you? Who do you think is your most underrated goalkeeper of 2021? It's hard to think of, of goalkeepers. Well, I think goalkeepers are, are kind of inherently underrated, aren't they? Um, mm. But the one that, that springs to mind a bit, I think, is Mike Mignon. Just because I feel like... Mm. I feel like he's not... like I don't hear about him in conversations around who is the best keeper in the world. And obviously he's had a huge task of having to fill Gianluigi Donnarumma's boots um, at Milan and has done a really good job of it. Um, and was obviously instrumental for Lille last year. I think he saved around five post-shot expected goals. Obviously their defence in general was really good and we'll probably speak about their defence a little bit more as we go on, uh, you know, go on to the back line. But... Um, yeah, I feel like it's hard to look past him just because he's had such a good year. And I can't really think of many keepers who've had a better year than him, if I'm honest. Um, 
I know we've got kind of Eduard Mendy down here, who I think we can discuss for sure. Uh, but I feel like he gets more plaudits, and especially, you know, with winning the Champions League with Chelsea and whatnot. Mm. Um, and he's probably a bit more of a spectacular shot stopper. I think that always, you know, will, will gain more more recognition. Um, but yeah, Mike Mignon, I think I think in terms of the year that he's had, um, like I, I yeah, he's just not really put a foot wrong. Um, and that's obviously what you want in a keeper. So yeah, that's my pick for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, his record at Lille last year, 21 clean sheets in 38 games, which was the most in Europe. It's just a quite frightening number. And we have seen Lille slightly drop off this season. That's for a number of factors, but I think Mike Menion's exit is a big one. Henry, where do you stand on Edouard Mendy? I feel like it really divides the FD team between the Chelsea fans and the rest uh, in terms of his status in amongst yeah. the world. I mean, he, he clearly is probably slightly underrated, but I don't... Do you think he's one of the best keepers in the world? No, I don't think he is. But I also don't necessarily think you have to have one of the world's greatest keepers all the time. Uh, they are few and far between. And what he d was able to do, which Kepa certainly wasn't, is command that command his defence. He has an incredible defence in front of him. Let's make no mistake about it. Chelsea's defence is the envy of pretty much every side in the world. And he's just he's just the reassured figure at the back. Uh, you just you just know that sort of 7.5 out of 10 8 out of 10 chances he's probably going to stop I don't think that makes him an exceptional keeper but then again most of the top class keepers in the world don't often have much to do in the matches There's, um, but I think on raw ability there are better keepers than him we've seen him make a few mistakes recently his confidence has dipped at certain points that comes with the territory of being in the Premier League I don't yeah for me he's not amongst the very best keepers in the world but that also doesn't mean he has to be necessarily for Chelsea, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't think it's the kind of position where they need to go and spend 60 million, 50 million to go and sort it out. Like they lost Courtois, who is one of the best keepers in the world, but mm. he always wanted to go. And I think that actually, for whatever money they paid for him, 20 million, uh, Mendy has steadied the ship. I just, I'm, in terms of underrated keeper, I did a research into this, and uh, it's a bit of a weird one. But Stoller Dimitrevsky, uh, the the keeper for Raya Vallecano this season, mm, love it, um, Henry. Good he, stuff. He, I'm obsessed with Raya Vallecano, uh, <laughs> but he's incredible. He, um, so Raya are fourth at the moment, and it's off the back of basically their defence. I think they've got like the, the fourth best defence in La Liga this season. He has saved 6.1 uh, benefit post-shot XG. So he saved 6.1 goals more than expected this season, uh, so that, which is by far the best in La Liga. Uh, he's, he's hardly conceded this term. He helped them get promoted last season. And actually, he was pretty impressive for North Macedonia at the Euros, having helped get them there. Everyone thinks about Goran Pandev, but actually Dimitrevsky in goal was equally as important uh, for most of that campaign. And he's he's putting together a stunning season this term um, as as Rio looked to probably put on one of their best ever results. And yeah, I think, I think he deserves like a huge shout out for everything that he's achieved this season. It's great to see their defence put up in lights, but I agree with McCubbs in principle that Mike Magnon should be the number one, but Dimitrievsky, mm. real, real, real shot stopper. <laughs> also, Max, Maximian at, uh, at Granada, I've not like tracked him recently, but he had an amazing start to the season. Um, probably not in the conversation because he was like not playing regular t uh, football at Sporting before he went to Granada. But um, but yeah, I think he's kind of in with a shout of a of a keeper who I think is gonna um, wh whose profile is gonna rise. I think in the next couple of years um, for sure. Yeah, I think, a, I think a person that definitely deserves a mention is Jose Sarr as well. Mm, Obviously yes. arrived at Wolves. Big shoes to fill with Rui Patricio leaving, one of Wolves' most experienced players. You know, over 100 caps for Portugal, etc. Jose Sarr comes in. Not a lot of people, including myself, knew a lot about him, but he won the league title with Olympiacos. Uh, he's got the best save percentage in Europe's top five leagues, 85%. And you might just say, oh, Wolves don't really give away that higher quality of shots. So it's obviously easy to make those saves. Well, no, he's also saved the most post-shot expected goals, so basically prevented the most expected goals with 6.8, and he's kept seven clean sheets, which is only topped by 10 keepers in Europe, which considering he's playing for Wolves, a sort of mid-table Premier League team, I think he deserves a lot, a lot of credit. And yeah, his shot stopping has been excellent so far. So what a great pickup from Wolves. I mean, yeah, after a little dip in their transfer activity, probably over the last 18 months, they got back on track with this addition in the summer of Jose Sarr. So, are we concluding that we're going with Mike Menion, most underrated goalkeeper? Mm. Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to. All right, go on. Then. We don't see. We don't. I see do, I do like the Vallecano guy, though. I do. I do like him. I think Henry. I think you argued that very well. 
Okay. Well, okay, we'll give clearly you know up. half a point to Henry, but Mike Menyard is our <laughs> most underrated goalkeeper so far. Let's move on to right back. I want to suggest Giovanni Di Lorenzo. I think right backs it's often difficult to be underrated. I think the big dogs, the Hakimis, Trents, Jameses, Cancelos, etc., they get a lot, a lot of credit. Um, and a lot of top clubs around Europe, you know, Barcelona, Juventus, Real Madrid, when Carver Howe's not fit, probably don't have an elite right back right now. So finding an underrated one is quite tricky. Um, I'd probably suggest Giovanni Di Lorenzo. I think he's been a solid performer for Napoli throughout the season. Played very, very well last year. Played all but two games. Got three assists, sorry, three goals and six assists. Uh, he's played for all but one of their league games so far this season. He's got one goal and one assist. He was also Italy's right back during the Euros. Uh, get this, he ranks in the top percent of fullbacks for passes attempted, pass completion and progressive passes in the top 15% for shot creating actions and progressive carries, which I was per like presently, so pleasantly surprised about rather, because when I've, whenever I watch Napoli, I think he's very good going backwards as well. I think he's got a bit of everything to his game. And at, if he wasn't 28, I'd really like to see him join a really, really top club in the summer. But with the, with the talent coming through in that position, particularly a bit younger, there are probably younger, more attractive options. But I think Giovanni Di Lorenzo definitely deserves a shout for this. Uh, Henry, who would you like to suggest as another underrated right back? Well, you know, I've got a soft spot for Kieran Trippier. So I would probably <laughs> think about him. Old Trips. Uh, six, yeah, six assists in 28 games at Leti last season. He really was one of their main players um, on the, uh, as they sort of surged towards that La Liga title. And although this season he hasn't really been the same player, I don't think he really wants to be at Atletico Madrid, truth be told. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. I think... I think Di Lorenzo is a great shout. Joachim Myler as well um, hasn't perhaps kicked on after his Euros tournament. I don't want to give this to someone based just off a, their summer exploits, but Joachim Myler was brilliant last term. But yeah, for me it's Trippier, although I mean yeah, or Di Lorenzo. I think Trippier is a good shout as well. Yeah, let's see where he ends up in January. There's lots of speculation that other big Premier League clubs are now going in for him. I mean, McCubbs, a player that probably doesn't get the credit in the Man City team is probably Carl Walker, but I think he's ultra consistent. Really, I know he made that rash error in the Champions League the other day against RB Leipzig getting himself sent off but he's mm. been performing at the top in a number of positions for a while now yeah I mean I mean he's always had uh, you know the odd error in his game um, and I think you know most kind of Man City fans kind of expect that well kind of accept that with him but um, but yeah I think he's been quite underrated for about two or three years now I think when you look back at kind of 2017-2018 time the kind of Centurions team he was Considered by many as as you know among you know among among the best or, or the best right back in in world football, um, and he's never really been considered that as well. Actually, speaking about Euros, Carl Walker arguably the best right back at, at the Euros. Yeah. Um, he he had an absolute monster tournament. Um, so yeah, I think he'll always be in the conversation. But equally, he is he is a player who has had quite a good reputation throughout his career. So I do think Di Lorenzo is kind of qualifies better in that sense I do also want to shout out Lucas Vasquez although he's not played there more recently he hit him filling in at right back was vital to Real Madrid mm. in the kind of um you know at the end of the 20 20 20 21 season um obviously they didn't end up winning the league but they you know you know they had a really good run in the Champions League didn't they um you know amid a, an injury crisis and I think Lucas Vasquez was um, yeah, one of the top performing right backs in Europe um, for for a period. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'd quite like to shout at him. But yeah, I think I'm, I'm with you on Di Lorenzo for sure. Okay, great stuff. We've got Mike Menyon and Di Lorenzo in so far. Let's move on to centre back. Henry, the floor is yours. You can name one, two. Who do you want? Um, it's it's tricky here. I I, I mean I actually, I I think for Kyo Tomori, I put him in the podcast the other day as the signing, sort of the permanent over the last year, the best permanent signing yeah. since Ooh. sort of. January, uh, start of the year. since he moved to AC Milan, I think he's just been absolutely fantastic to knock out Romagnoli in the manner that he's done. He's clearly learning so much next to Simon Kier, who's, I think, equally could be here. I think Kier is sort of banging his drum for a while. He was a bit of a journey, journeyman for a long time, but he's really found his feet with AC Milan, and Tomori looks excellent next to him. Um, there's all this talk about Joe Gomez the other day, and I was, I was like, I, I wish AC Milan were going for him, so we'd have a Tomori Gomez. Uh, back Real Madrid now looking at Joe Gomez supposedly. yes rumour has it yeah but um, yeah Tomori maybe for me uh, Edir Militao I just think what he's done at Real Madrid the way he's gone in there and um, stepped up to the plate with because they, obviously they lost Varane and Sergio Ramos last year but Militao has just comfortably got to grips with life next to David Alaba I, I think Edir Militao is perfect um, 
in that regard. Really competent. Looks like he'll probably at the next World Cup be Brazil's main man at the back as well. Um, if with Thiago Silva not getting any any uh, any younger. So yeah, for me, I, I'd like to go for Militao on this one. I like it. Militao is a very good good suggestion. Can't really argue with that. Such a good six months uh, in particular. Um, the Cubs, who would you like to suggest as a partner or replacement for Militao? Um, I think Jose Font has to be in the mm. back line. Um, you know, Captain Lille to, to the title. You know, that defence, like we said, with Mike Magnon, like that defence was just just unreal wasn't it how many goals did they they conceded fewer goals than anyone else in Europe's top five leagues if I'm not mistaken um, I think they did yeah so, so as watertight as, as any defence in Europe um, and you know a, a player who you know looked, you know, his career kind of looked over at one point after le- yeah. uh, leaving West Ham and obviously like struggled with injuries as well but um, but yeah he's been a superb captain for that side um, and okay Lille aren't at the level that they were last last year but um, yeah, I think he was just he, he was the perfect kind of organiser for that back line he was super good in the air like decent on the ball as well you know, had, you know, managed to bring it you know, managed to kind of blood in a player like Sven Botman next to him, kind of seamlessly um, you know you know, defensive partnerships often take a while to come together but Sven Botman arrived at the club and although he is obviously very talented was you know, as a very young player playing in a new league and playing alongside Jose Font he was just able to, to fit in um, you know, fit in very quickly, um, and I think you have to yeah give give credit to Font for that. So yeah, I think for me, I'm not. I don't really. I could kind of take or leave the others. Not take like I, yeah. I mean, I, could, I don't really mind who who else is in the back line, um, but I think Jose Font has to be there personally. Yeah, j- j- Mike. Just to add to that, I was looking at the league and table earlier, and by expected points, Lilla only meant to be three points behind PSG. Mad. Um, this season because they've drawn uh, so many games this term they haven't actually lost a ton Lil, but they've drawn loads and if they just had a bit more a bit more clinical up front they could have maybe mm. turned the table and it looks like Font is still sort of stepping up and being the man they need to be he still plays for Portugal most of the time as well so yeah I, I do I, I agree with you I think Jose Font is such a consistent along with Benjamin Andre in the field such a consistent guy okay I like Benjamin I like Jose Font in there Benjamin Andre hasn't made my suggestions on who we get but we'll, maybe we'll talk about him in due course in defensive midfield but Jose Font as well okay Mike Menyon behind him as well at Lille as well loving the Lille inclusion so far I'd like to push forward Alessandro Bastoni. I've got a bit of a man crush on this guy. I think he's absolutely yeah. exceptional. I think him, De Vrij and Skriniar were an amazing unit last term under Conte and recently have got it to get up together under Simone and Zaghi with a slightly more attacking system that he's introduced there. Um, and I think Bastoni you know, has been a, a ever-present uh, for Inter for a number of uh, years now. He's missed five of their last 56 league games. His range of passing is brilliant, excellent in the air. I think he'll be, you know, a potential one of the best centre backs in the world in, in a few years' time. So I'd like to push Bastoni Oof. in there. I think Thiago Silva, 37 as well. What he's done at Chelsea in the last year, I think a lot of people, particularly in England, didn't really appreciate just how talented he was. But to uh, be one of the best centre backs in the Premier League at 37, I think deserves a mention as well. So who are we going with to pair pair alongside oh Jose Font, Henry? Who do you want? Oh, well, Jose Font definitely in. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd go. Oh, I like your Bastoni suggestion. I really do. He's probably the one that's. Sort of sung about the least out of that, that famed back three I really like Tamori I just think over the last 12 months over the last year mm-hmm. Tamori's been excellent I really think Tamori's been um, if we're looking at this purely in 2021 I think Tamori has been brilliant for 12 months straight okay cool let's go with Tamori and Jose Fon I'm very happy with that duo oh, wow. I think that's Love a very that. strong centre back pairing my Cubs let's move on to left back who would you like to, like to suggest for left back I think similarly to right back maybe you know the big names get all the all the talking yeah. about. You know the Robertsons, Alfonso Davies, etc., Luke Shaw, etc. But maybe a bit harder to find a truly underrated left back this year. Yeah, again, I, yeah, I do. I do find it difficult. Um, you've obviously got Robin Gerson's down this year, who I think you know what hasn't hasn't really been spoken about as much this season, but has still been um, pretty strong. Um, but I think um, for me, anyway, as a player who I've only re- recently started kind of taking notice of is, is David Raum at, at, at Hoffenheim mm. um, yes, I think yes. he'd be my suggestion um, obviously you included him in a, strip, a script the other day didn't you McCubs? yeah for Bar- yeah, as, as a suggestion for Barcelona um, one of many suggestions that we make for Barcelona that will never ever happen because <laughs> they don't <laughs> their recruitment team just clearly doesn't think like that who knows maybe they will more more these uh, you know in years to come but um, 
yeah, I just yeah, he's just had a, he has had a, a, an amazing year. Um, you know, it was you know first half of the year. Well, for the first you know for his whole career was with with Greuther Furt in in the the Bundesliga Zwei. Um, last year he got like thirteen assists, which was the most in in the second division in Germany. Uh, obviously they got promoted, and then he moved for free to to Hoffenheim, and I think he's already got something like. It's either four or five assists and like a goal or two as well for Hoffenheim. He's creating, I think, more chances than any other left back in Europe, bar one. Um, you know, he's he's kind of creating the same amount of chances that like Luke Shaw was for for Man United last year. Um, and yeah, his delivery is just really good. He's just like a really good kind of classic left back, um, but he can also kind of come inside and, and link up play in the kind of half spaces and whatnot. So he's kind of really quite an all round talent. Not like the not like the most amazing at like going past players or anything, but in terms of getting to the byline, putting in really good crosses. Um, yeah, he takes a lot of boxes and I expect he will move on to a bigger club in the next couple of years. Um, so I think, yeah, out of out of left backs who aren't yeah not necessarily making loads of headlines, I think he would be my pick. I love that. McCubbs has served you, David Raum. Oh. Henry, who, who are you replying with? All right, well, I see your David Raum and I'll, <laughs> I'll raise you a Javi Galan. <laughs> yeah, good guy. Celta Vigo, Celta Vigo. Nice. Yeah, this guy... His stats are off the chain. Uh, so I think they, he was at Huesca last year and he made made waves. I think only Messi had dribbled past more players than him or perhaps he was topping the dribble charts. But anyway, I've had a look again because he's gone to Celta Vigo under one of my favourite managers, Eduardo Coudet. And he's, he's for the second season straight, he's won the most tackles out of any player. He's attempted the most tackles. He's sixth for interceptions. Fifth for touches, he's first for carries into the final third, second for progressive carries, um, he's in the top 10 for pressures, crosses. He, he's only got one assist this year, he's 27 years old, so I think so he hasn't only got a few more years with his style of play really at the top. He's first for throw ins taken. I mean, what more do you want? Uh, this <laughs> so, Where are these stats uh, coming from? Where are these stats coming from? There, yeah. But it's, it is, he, this guy, he, it's nuts. And I think Celta Vigo got him for such a nominal fee from Huesca when they went down. Uh, but he, he was killing it last year and he's killing it again. He draws as many fouls as anyone in, in La Liga 2. He's just an absolute nuisance down the left-hand side of defence. And he I think he's just a really exciting player to watch. So fast, not tons of end product, but quite clearly very defensively astute as well. And sometimes we forget that is the principal principal role of a defender but I mean I really like the, the Raum shout as well so either way do because I'll leave this one up to you yeah I think Raum's a very good shout I'd like to give a mention to Zinchenko not across the whole year but I thought he was excellent in the latter stages of the Champions League last term as well I actually took Cancelo's place in, in lots of those big games which seems absolutely remarkable now I think Marcus Acuna has had a very good year at Sevilla regained his place in the Argentina team as well he's been capped 11 times within this year played a role in their Copa America triumph as well which was really the Messi show, but still he was a part of it. Nuno Mensch as well, you know, Primera Liga winner with Sporting CP getting that move to PSG. Hasn't looked out of place yes. there as well. I think he's been excellent. But I'm happy to go with David Raum uh, as oh, well. So oh. let's, that's our back line and back Honored five, Dave. basically locked down. Uh, lovely stuff. Let's move into defensive midfield. I think the best shout for this is Bruno Gu- uh, Guimaraes as well at Leon. Didn't play a lot the year before last, but... Last year was excellent, played 33 games, only 24 years old as well, so has room to grow in that position. You don't really see players really hit their straps in that position until they're about 27, 28. Um, But yeah, really, really consistent, offers a lot in terms of all-round game. Three tackles and interceptions, so not massive defensive numbers, but nearly over a shot a game, nearly a key pass, nearly 1.5 dribbles as well. Completes over 80% of those dribbles as well. So really confident in tight spaces as well. He's got a great range of passing. He just looks tailor-made for a big club, to be honest. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a move next summer with Leon sort of struggling under Petr Bosch uh, so far in Liga. I don't think Petr Bosch necessarily has too much longer at Leon. And get this, he ranks in the top percent of midfielders in Europe for passes attempted, progressive passes, progressive carries and tackles. So really, everything you'd want for in a defensive midfielder. Um, and I'd love to see him get a move to a really, really top club. Um, so I think he's my shout. McCubbs, who's your shout for a defensive midfielder? It's a tough one, really. Um, I feel like there aren't that many. I think I think you make a really good point with mm. Um I think he's the most exciting um, defensive midfielder in France. Um, we spoke about Benjamin Andre. I think Benjamin Andre has to be in the conversation um, just because he was so... So vital to Lille's, um, you know, well, he's been so vital to Lille for, you know, such a long time now. Um, 
But I feel like we've got two Lille players in there already, or at least we've got two players who've played for Lille this year. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to go with Gimaraish. I can't really think of someone who's both like had a great year and is also like genuinely like really underrated. It's, yeah. it's quite hard to. It's I think, quite hard to yeah. think. I think like there's I can't remember his name now. The guy at Stuttgart who was excellent last year, but Stuttgart uh, obviously not had a great Santiago Ascesiba. Nah, I'm thinking it's some, someone oh, else. Is he I'm thinking of. Um, I don't know who he he, 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 he 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 partners Oral Mangala. Oh, is he Japanese? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't remember his name? his name now. But he was he was an absolute monster last annoying. year. But um but yeah obviously Stuttgart haven't been you know, haven't been quite the same form this year. So um, all this season. Fans, spam the comments with that guy's name. Yeah, I think I completely. He's completely oh, so kind of lost. That's really him. annoying me. But um, but yeah, I'm, Endo. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Endo. That's it. Endo. I think it's Endo. Yeah. I think it's Endo. Um, yeah, I think he was he was superb last year. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else in the Bundesliga. I feel like the, I mean, like someone like Florian Neuhaus. Like I know, like mm. Munch and Gladbach haven't been so good. In and out of the team now after, as well. After the last yeah last twelve months, but I think he's quite My... an underrated talent in general. So my, only say, was Anguisa. my only mm. suggestion was Anguisa, but is he as underrated as Bruno Gomes? I'm not sure. I, th- yeah. I do because I actually think that's just a brilliant shout. So I Thanks, guys. Gosh, <laughs> lock him in. Wow. Him after in. My, after you, you know, poo pooed my shouts in the East Dulwich Tavern for about three weeks. This is great <laughs> news. I'm loving this. Quick mention as well. He's not underrated. He's playing for a phenomenal team. But I think Rodri has been absolutely outstanding mm. at the start of this season. Um, but yeah, not underrated. Probably doesn't deserve. Uh, to make an underrated 11. But yeah, shout out Rodri. Let's move on to the attacking midfielder role. We're kind of not quite sure what formation we're playing. Maybe a 4-3-3. Uh, who's going either side of Bruno Guimaraes, Henry? Who would you like to suggest? Oh, goodness. Um, well, we've got here Mason Mount. And I understand why people put that because he is peripherally sort of not... He's not glitzy enough for most people. But I think... I don't think he deserves to be in the conversation on the basis that he's just too good for this list. Fair he enough. is a world-class mm. player. And that's that. Like, Mason Mount is a stunning footballer. And anyone who doesn't believe, doesn't think that now, is just... Being stubborn. Relative. <laughs> just stubborn or ignorant. One of the two. <laughs> yeah. uh, whatever. So, yeah, I think we can leave that alone. I feel like we're going to France with most of our suggestions at the moment. It's a great place for underrated talent league, and underrated fair, talent. But, yeah, but you know what? I'm Just because I love sporting as well, Pedro Gonçalves plays as a number 10 or a right, right winger. Uh, 26 league goals contribution for Sporting CP in 2021. This guy's nuts. They are so good under Ruben Amorim. They won the double last season. They're like joint top of the of Liga Nosh this term. Primera Liga. My apologies to all the people that hate us using the <laughs> sponsor, sponsorship title. It's that they're not and even sponsored by the... Nosh anymore, though. That's the thing. It's um, not... I can't remember who it is now. So yeah, we, we actually. Right. Can't what say even it. is Nosh? Is it a beer? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. But it also it also sponsors like music festivals there as well. Um, Do they? Oh, yeah, I'm right. not sure. Anyway, I don't sorry, think it, I don't think that. it is a beer. I think we'd know about it if it was a beer. Yeah, bloody. But yeah, I, I I think I think Pedro Gonçalves is going to be a big name eventually. But yeah, I don't I don't know if you've got any other suggestions. Yeah, I mean, he um, was mentioned. He was at Wolves. Um, Pedro Gonçalves, which is kind of crazy that they they let him go. I think for a very cheap fee as well, but it just didn't quite work out there. Uh, my Cubs, have you got anyone else for this attacking midfielder role? Um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of shouts in Italy. Um, Petra Jelinski at, at Napoli. Yeah. I think he's been quite underrated for, for, for quite a long time now, hasn't he? Um, but like, yeah, 10 goals and 10 assists last season. He's got six goals and five assists already. This term, um, his underlying numbers are really solid. Um, so I think he's he's a good shout. I think for me, Ruslan Malinowski's had a, had a superb year. Mm. Um He's not been quite as productive this season as he was last. Um, you know, he got got himself like twelve assists last season. And I think last season in particular as well, what was pretty remarkable was that he really stepped into that void left um by Papu Gomez in terms of kind of providing the creative spark in the final third um for Atalanta. And um I think that was really important for them in the second half of the season, um, in terms of kind of securing Champions League football again. Um, yeah, I just think as an all-round kind of attacking presence, I think he's just he's just great. His passing is obviously brilliant. I think he's quite underrated on the ball as well as a dribbler. Um, so yeah, I think I, I really like Ruslan Malinowski, but I'm not sure. I've not watched enough of him this season, but yeah, his his productivity has not been not been quite as good. But yeah. um, but I think for, for for I think his yeah I think his contribution last season was a bit underrated. Yeah, definitely. It was immense. I thought he had quite a quiet Euros compared to what I thought he was mm. going to do. I thought Ukraine were going to do slightly better. Um, but Zielinski, I think, is a, is a great shout. 
Should we go with Zielinski and Pedro Gonzalez either side of Bruno Guimaraes? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. pretty attacking midfield, but I like it. Why not? <laughs> You know, in fantasy land, you can pair whatever you like, guys. Let dreams become reality. Let's move on to <laughs> wingers, guys. Who wants to start? Why don't I start? Okay, I think one guy who isn't really talked enough enough uh, about enough, uh, mainly because he's playing for a team that are massively underperforming, but I thought Yannick Carrasco was really good last year. I know he was yeah. playing most of the time as a left wing back, but he was brilliant um, throughout 2021 for Atletico Madrid. He got six goals and 10 assists in 30 league games as Atleti won the league. And I know, you know, a lot of people are now questioning whether, you know, they were really as, as good as that league title suggested, given their collapse in the second half of the season, given the fact Jan Oblak put together one of the best goalkeeping performances of all time. Luis Suarez, everything he was hitting went in. Marcus Lorento was playing a lot better than this year. But Yannick Carrasco was crucial to that team as well. And I think, you know, he... he sort of stepped up in a lot of crucial moments as well and in their bigger games as well it felt like Yano Krasko was often providing the the energy and the spark down that left hand side he's got six goal contributions in 16 league games so far this season they've now lost four in a row don't think it's a great time for Atleti and I'm not gloating about that I genuinely you know it's a bit of a tricky time for them but I think Yano Krasko deserves a shout Henry which other winger would you like to mention um I just think Mikel Yathabal is mm. He's just destined for a big move. I'm just amazed that he's still, I mean it politely, that he's still at Sociedad. I, I guess for Sociedad, it's almost a perfect storm of troubled finances elsewhere, which has allowed them, and actually I think for a lot of clubs, allowed them to keep on to their players in that kind of 40, 50 million pound category. So, you know, in, in few and far between at the moment, we've seen Barcelona go in for Ferran Torres now. That's well, um, how they've done that. Uh, I don't quite know. A but, big um, old loan. Big old loan. Big old loan. <laughs> More loan money. Love it. <laughs> Love to see it. Um, but yeah, oh yeah, about 19 goal contributions in 33 league games since last season. So I thought they had finished fifth. I mean, it, it is pretty exceptional. This season, eight goals, one assist in 17 league and Europa League games. I, I think he's stunning. I do want to give a shout out though, because I was researching this yesterday for a script. I was writing about Walter Mazzari at Udinese. Mm. Jao Pedro is their forward. Yeah. Not to be confused with the the Watford Jao Pedro. He's a 29-year-old Brazilian. He scored like nine and assisted one this term for an, an awful Cagliari. Not Udinese, forgive me. Cagliari. Cagliari, for an, yeah, I was thinking. For an awful Cagliari side. Um, and since the start of 2019, he scored more goals than any Brazilian in Europe's top five leagues. I think 16 more than... Uh, Gabi Jesus and even more, way more than Neymar. Uh, he, he, he seems to be chronically underrated because he's. This is third season straight that he's been banging for Cagliari. I don't know why he's still there. I, 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 he plays on the wing. He can play forward as well. He he's 29, so not really at an age where a lot of clubs would look at him. But Jao Pedro has been honestly great for a very disappointing team for a long time now. So I think he deserves a shout. But yeah, probably Mikel Ayazabal in if we had to really put a team together. But I like Jao Pedro to be mentioned. Yeah, I think Ayazabal in particular is a great shout. Jao Pedro as well, as you say, been been banging them in for a while. Shout out to him for staying loyal to Cagliari. Don't know why he hasn't got the move either. McCubbs, anyone else to mention this winger category? Not really. I think if you'd asked me blind who I'd have as the wingers, I think I would say Carrasco and Ayazabal. Um, I Love think it. Carrasco... I think Carrasco's been Atletico Madrid's best player full stop this this year. Um, and I think he was arguably their best outfield player yeah, in that season. Like he was just so good. And he's he's still even this season when, you know, yeah, like you said, they they've been in awful form. Um, you know, Simeone's tactics are yeah, they they're they're not they're not producing going forward in the way that they should be. Um but despite that, Carrasco is still carrying that attack. I think he's completing three over three dribbles this season. Um, so, like three dribbles a game, obviously. But um, and yeah, he's kind of providing a lot of their kind of creativity as well. So, like, yeah, I think he's. I think he has to be nailed in. And obviously, Yathbal also plays off the left, but he's also quite versatile. So I feel like we could we could stick <laughs> him on the right, couldn't we? I think he was also great at the at the Euros as well. Yeah. Yathbal. I feel like I feel like he got a lot of hate because he missed a lot of chances, which he did, especially <laughs> when he was like playing through the middle. But I actually think when he played through the middle, he was quite underrated as a focal point. Um, and I think I think that Spain team in general were really wasteful. I think they would have won the tournament if they weren't that wasteful. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, I really like Oyathabal and yeah, I'm with, very much with Henry. I think it's only a matter of time until we see him go to one of the big dogs. Yeah, 
But Spain played some lovely stuff in that tournament throughout. I think, yeah, Dani Olmo as well was great in that. Sarabia had a really good tournament as well. Um, just not, as you say, some some poor finishing let them down and, and they lost that penalty shootout to Italy in the semi-finals, of course. Let's move on to strikers. This is where it gets interesting. Quite a few names we've written down here as potentials. I'm intrigued to see who Henry Hill wants to be leading the line in our 4-3-3. Uh, what are you thinking, Henry? It's tricky. I think Jonathan David's brilliant. Another Lil suggestion mm. that he's been so good this term. 13 goals. Um... Sorry, 11, uh, 11 and 18 this season, 13 last season. I like Jonathan David, but I, I is he underrated? I don't know. Mate, I'm going to go for Patrick Schick. I think Ooh. I think he did so well at the Euros. Obviously scored the goal of the tournament, probably one of the all-time great Euros goals. I think it's quite an it. overrated goal. I'm just going to put it oh. oh, I, I, I don't, don't think, think it's so. particularly special. And I don't think, I'm not oh. just saying that because it was against Scotland who I sort of semi support. Of course support. you are. I genuinely just don't think it's that good a goal. <laughs> Okay. Am I mad? Well, I, I think, you know what? I think, I think I think the fact that um, what's his name got caught up in the um, in the net in the net afterwards. I think that adds that adds like an extra five points onto the goal. <laughs> so like I can see where you're coming from in that sense. It, it's like it's more. Nah, it's still an amazing goal because he it's takes it. It's on like the goal. half. It's, like, it's, it's basically on the half volley, right? History. It's like I just. I, uh, yeah, I didn't. Like, I said it's up there. I did say I agree. It's not the best goal in Euro's history, but it certainly was the most memorable goal. I just think whenever a keeper's of, like of off his like way, he was outside of his box. Like he curled it in, yeah, but the keeper wasn't there. But he I didn't. But it did. It, it didn't bounce before it went in, did it? No, I feel like it went purely into. The, I wouldn't think it went straight yeah. into the net, which does add you know Oof. five points to Gryffindor. Mm. But I just I don't like it. <laughs> so already after debating it, it's up ten points based on Marshall <laughs> yeah. being in the net and it not bouncing once. So. And yet you still argue against it. Now, I listen, I, I, I understand what you're coming from, but I still think it was cool. 16 and one, 16 goals, one assist this turn. This this comes after, bear in mind, he was basically, it was deemed a bit of a failure, was it, at Roma or wherever. It, uh, and then it struggled at Leipzig too. So I think to see Schick kind of back on a pedal stool where he belongs it, it, it is, is, is excellent. So yeah, for me, I'd like to go for Schick. Haller as well, but he's got so much press at the moment. I can see why someone might want to include Haller too. Yeah, I'm absolutely fine with Schick being included in the team of the year. Guys, let us know in the comments, where do you stand on that Schick goal? Was it that special or am I just being, you know, grumpy? I don't know. Let let us know in the comments. Uh, McCubbs, who would you like to put forward to rival Schick or maybe you just um, agree with Schick? I quite like Schick as a shout, but I think I think a player who doesn't get enough plaudits in general is Duvan Zapata. Mm. Um, like, his goal scoring record is ridiculous. Obviously, him and Muriel have an ama- both have amazing kind of goals per get- per minute ratios, don't they? At, at Atalanta, uh, but Zapata in-, in particular has obviously led that forward line for a while now. Fifteen goals and nine assists in the league last term. Twelve goals and seven assists um, in the league in Champions League this year already. Um, he's operating at over a goal or an assist per ninety um, this term. So, like, I mean. Numbers wise, amazing, but also like I just don't think there are many. I just don't think there are many strikers who I who I watch where if the ball drops to them in the area, I'm that confident about them scoring. Like Duvan Zapata, I think is, you know, what I mean, like you look at, I feel like I almost you know rate his chances as good as someone like Benzema, like at this moment in time, um, and I, it always takes me by surprise when like a commentator or a journalist is like oh yeah, he's one of the best strikers in Europe. Because I just don't hear it that much, but I think mm. he is comfortably one of the best strikers in Europe, like comfortably in the top 10. And I just don't think a lot of the time he doesn't may- maybe get the recognition for that because he's playing in an Atalanta side, which is just, you know, is, is known for being very attacking and, and creating loads of great chances. But I think that takes away from just how good an operator he is in the box. Um, you know, even if he is being supplied by, you know, a, a brilliant system, um, he also, you know, he also contributes a lot creatively, um, and he is, yeah, he's just an excellent number nine. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I'm going to put up Zapata to, to rival Schick. So I think it's got to be your deciding vote against Duke. I against Duke. just because he had a weaker last season than this season, and he scored a very overrated goal in the Euros. <laughs> I'm going to give it to Zapata, who I, I agree with my Cubs as 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 a ball striker. He is an insanely good ball striker. And and to keep Luis Muriel 
on the bench over the last few years, who's also chipped in with numerous great goals yeah. as well, is a really big achievement because I think Luis Muriel's really underrated as well, but probably too old to make this list and maybe doesn't play enough football. Okay, guys, this is our 11. Most underrated team of 2021. We've got Mike Menion in goal, Giovanni Di Lorenzo at right back. Centre-backs was Jose Font and Fikayo Tamori. Left-back <laughs> was... Uh, David ba ba uh, Raum, was it? Yeah, David Raum. Yes. Defensive midfielder, Bruno Guimaraes. Uh, either side of him was Zielinski and uh, Pedro Gonçalves. Uh, wingers was Mikel Oyazabal and Yannick Carrasco. And leading the line for our all-star team was Duvan Zapata. <laughs> I actually think that's a really good side. I would love to watch that team walk, mm. like, play it. I don't know whether it would actually work in terms of the midfield, but yeah. I love I feel I like love the attacking midfielders and the wingers would, would clash a bit in some ways. Yeah. But, Especially with uh, yeah. Oyazba loving to come inside as well. But mm. we, we see, we'll see, we'll see. Guys, who are your shouts for most underrated players and how would they fit into our team? Who would you replace, etc.? Get your answers in the comments down below and let's move on to our next section. Okay, guys, unfortunately, there is no big match predictions this week as most European leagues, no, I think every European league is now taking a break until the first week of January. But we need to review what went down last week when we're still filming in the East Dulwich Tavern. I can reveal the scores. Going into last week, I was on 13 points, Henry was on eight, and McCubbs was on six. But all change, guys, all change. AC Milan, Napoli. Henry went 2-1 Milan, McCubbs went 2-2, Doogie went 2-1 to Napoli. The final score was 1-0 to Napoli, so I got one point. The other guys didn't get anything. Sevilla, Atletico Madrid. Henry went 2-1. And the final score was 2-1 to Sevilla. So Henry yes, got a perfect score, his first of the series. Congratulations. McCubbs went 1-0 to Sevilla, also gets a point. I went 1-1. I think that's the first time I pick up no points on a score. Gutted about that. Wolfsburg versus Bayern. Henry, another perfect score. 4-0, he went 4 for Bayern. McCubbs went 5-1 to Bayern. I went 3-0 to Bayern. So McCubbs and myself share a point. Uh, we don't share it, we got one each. And Henry <laughs> gets three. That means the scores going into 2022, where we will be picking up after the uh, Continental Club, which we're filming after this, which goes out on the 31st. So the week after this one, going into next week, will be Doogie on 15, Henry on 14, and McCubbs on eight. So it's really hotting up, guys, a lot to look forward to in 2022 in terms of big match predictions. Let's move straight into quick fire questions though, because Morgs1507 has said, sorry, where have Barcelona got the money to sign Ferran Torres? Now we're gonna divide this into two sections. McCubbs, you're gonna do the facts and figures. Henry, you're gonna do, well, we'll all give our opinion at the end, but Henry's gonna do more opinion. McCubbs, where is this money coming from? Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't have the biggest. Like, I've not looked into it like massively. I thought I don't you did a whole the, I, athletic style investigation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I, I got I got Dermot Corrigan on the phone, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he gave me the lowdown. Uh, as far as I know, basically it's just a, a big loan. They just they managed to secure a loan to to get to get the deal done, which I kind of thought was out of Barca's remit. Now I kind of thought they weren't able to do anything, you know, in terms of you know getting loans, considering they they've still got outstanding payments but um but yeah um they, they secured a loan to, to make the deal happen but having said that they still can't add him to their squad um until they sell players so i think january is going to be a big month for selling we were talking off camera about you know um tt whether whether they'll be able to get rid of him obviously he's made the team more recently though so mm. um yeah, it's going to be. I, I, I think it's. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting month. I think it'll be. Yeah, all eyes on Barcelona in January because I think Xavi is going to be super, super keen to get Ferran Torres in that forward line um, for the second half of the season. So yeah, watch this space. But yeah, like that's that's as much as as I know. Is they basically yeah managed to secure a loan. Will that? I don't know how this works financially, but also a space in the squad will surely be freed up by Aguero's retirement as well. So yeah, in terms of the squad, it shouldn't be an issue. It's just the money which seems a bit yeah confusing. wages. Um, yeah. Henry, you were saying that you put out a tweet yesterday and you got a bit of a backlash. What was what was your tweet? What was the backlash? Yeah, I, I said it was City getting into the festive spirit by basically gifting him to Barcelona because it kind of is a gift. We're talking about a guy that won the Spanish Player of the Year last season. He's been very impressive in when he's played for City. He's excellent for his country as well. And yeah, 55 million... I think 10 million in add-ons euros this is I think 7 million of those euros almost pretty much secured so that will won't be too hard to activate that 
Um, that's still the the point is City didn't need to sell him. He was right. in, he had a five year deal. They could have asked for way more money from someone else. Um, I can't, I rate it from City. I rate the fact Guardiola's gone. Well, look, he doesn't want to be here. He wants to go play football. He's Spanish. Yeah, obviously, a lot of the City boardroom have links with Barcelona. They just I, I rate the fact like was Leroy Sane. They just they facilitated a deal because mm. at the end of the day, money isn't massive to City. Like 10, 15 million either way isn't a massive deal. But they still. You know, there's still this is still one of the top prospects in in European football that we're talking about. He's 21 years old. It's an, this is an incredible signing by Barcelona for the money they paid. If we consider mm. the amount of money they've wasted over the years, I think this is really superb. But I still think City have done them a huge favour by letting this happen, and it, it is it's almost refreshing to see a transfer like this. Um, it sort of harks back, I think, it's a bit more kind of professional relationship between clubs, and maybe one day Barca will do City a favour in a certain regard, but. I still can't believe that he, he's gone for fairly modest money. And you can say, oh, well, City have doubled their money on a player. They could have tripled their money. Um, that's the reality of it. Yeah. But- I wonder whether it means increased, improved relations before a Frankie de Jong transfer this summer. Ooh. Who knows? Who knows? I, think, I, th- I mean, it also potentially just offsets what they could pay for Erling Haaland in the summer as well, right? Mm. And and that's like like well not like for like but you're getting rid of someone who was pay, who was who was playing at center forward this season to bring in <laughs> you know the 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 ultimate center forward signing so i think in that sense it could work out quite well for city at least from a kind of perspective of of them kind of doing you know doing kind of sustainable business hmm. um but i, I think do... p- potentially one of the biggest loser out of this is valencia though like they they sold him yes. to, to city for such a cut price um, at a time when they probably could have offered him to Barcelona for the money they've paid for him now, um, and, um, and and now, and now City have made a made a very healthy profit off him. Yeah, not, not, um, he, not he, even he's just been, that. He's by far their their biggest asset of the last, you know, last five years, isn't he? Um, I don't know whether they, I don't know whether they have much, they, there was any like sell on clauses in the contract though, so maybe no, they will get something. I, I was reading that. All the add-ons which City were meant to pay Valencia are now null and void. They were meant to pay sort of three, four million extra, which could have been really, really important to someone like Valencia. Mm. Um, but that's all now null and void. Yeah. So, so this is, if, in many ways, City have saved four million off this deal, and the way that amortization of contracts works, this will go down as a very small expenditure within their within their budget. Mm. So it is, it is, it is genius. But I still think they've done Barca a giant favour, and I don't think it's not disrespectful to either clubs. For suggesting that i get what you mean about the favor but they've still got 55 million euros up front for a player that wasn't a regular and who yeah was was maybe a bit unhappy as well and prior to grealish you know very city signed very few players for over 55 million euros or over over 60 million pounds at least uh, most players were sort of signed in that 60 million pound bracket i know they you know, Chris was like, basically, that's what they've spent on Nathan Ake. Nathan Ake was the only really overpriced player they bought, really, in the last two, three years. Yeah. They've generally signed players around the £50 million mark. And if they can get rid of Ferran Torres and it helps them get Erling Haaland, then I think it's a great move. If they don't manage to get Erling Haaland, then I think they've kind of shot themselves in the foot because they've got rid of a player who is very capable of playing number nine. So I think this is a, this is a transfer we'll be able to really reflect on in six months' time. It kind of depends all on Erling Haaland. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what goes down with that one. So congratulations to Barcelona. You've signed another great, very talented young Spanish player, really building on that Spanish core they've got going on there. But yeah, Man City, maybe a little bit puzzling, uh, puts a bit of pressure on their summer business, in my opinion. Let's move on to Ben Flyde's question, a little bit of a light Christmas number to wrap up this Christmas Eve. He says, what's your favourite Christmas song? My Cubs, what are, what are you going to be crooning out tonight over the fields of Hampton? <laughs> um... I am. Uh, I, I'm. I'm a bit of a sucker for like a sad kind of melancholic um, yes, kind of so really? winter song. Yeah. So um, get your get so your tissues I, out this Christmas. Exactly. So like E17, stay another day. I think is is really up there. Although there's no mention of Christmas, it is a Christmas song. Um, I love Didn't that. I, I love how that pat- goes off the top of my head. I'm sure, but we've definitely sung it to each other at like Christmas parties before. Yeah, that's uh, okay. That is a banger. Um, and then also like um, Power of Love by Frankie Goes to Hollywood I think that's just like a great a great song in general um, I'm trying to think of others uh, yeah that, those those are the two that's that kind of stick, stick out for me Fair what about enough. you boys Henry what do the what do the hills get get involved with on, on New Year's oh. on Christmas Eve 
similar to McCubbin, I quite like that kind of dark and gloomy uh, Christmas star <laughs> song. So no, I I, I love um, "Lonely This Christmas" by Mud. It's gonna be lonely. I, I, that's one of my favourite mm. ones. I never think about that uh, song. Um, it's so it's so good, and also I'm I'm loving for some reason Elvis Presley's "Blue Christmas." <laughs> Um, this year so yeah I don't know I quite like that you know in the movies where you see those American Christmas drinks parties and they've always got that kind of big band playing away Christmas yeah. tunes in the corner that's that's kind of my vision of Christmas sometimes and I can just see Elvis somewhere up in the heavens having a good sing song no. but yeah uh, th- those two at the moment but it really it really changes every year um, to be honest what do I like Christmas song wise I think it's difficult to top driving home for Christmas I can also get involved with a bit of Silent Night I know it's more of a carol but you know that really you know defines christmas for me um maybe nice. if i go to midnight mass tonight that's what i'll get involved with although probably in covid times not the best idea to go to midnight na- mass guys get your favorite christmas songs in the comments down below and let us know what you think about this ferran torres move and where are barcelona get, get, gonna get this cash from and whether they'll be able to pay back this loan in time guys happy christmas viewers thank you so much for watching all our content this year i hope you guys have enjoyed it we really are hoping to get back into a studio and to film more stuff in person because I know we, you know, the three of us have thoroughly enjoyed filming at the East Dulwich Tavern. Thank you very much to them for looking after us over the last month or two as well. Uh, McCubbs, what would you recommend in terms of our Christmas content for the viewers to get their teeth stuck into? Oh, um, yeah, there's quite a lot. There's a there, that explained that we spoke about earlier. Um, that uh, yeah, I watched the other day. I thought it was great, Dukes. Um, Thank you. I think Pat. Um, did Pat uh, voice it or was it your, you who voiced it? I can't remember. The Maldini but, um, one. Maldini one, yeah. That was me, I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that's really good about Maldini and AC Milan. Um, I think a lot of a lot of Milan fans were, were pretty happy about it in the comments. So go, go and check that out. Um, and keep your eyes peeled for a particular uh, show that used to be on this channel um, and yes. hasn't been for a little while that's going to be with you. I think on the 28th, so four days time. Um, there's a show uh, going to be on. Oh, yeah. very exciting. Henry, what, what are you uh, looking I, forward to over Christmas? I think we've got mean tweets coming out, yeah. which is always a good laugh. Uh, but to be honest, just spend time with your family. <laughs> Enjoy some, celebrate. Don't watch Football Daily on Christmas Day. You know, Have a nice time. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll catch up again in the new year. Perfect, guys. No, we won't, actually. We'll see them on New Year's Eve in the, oh, the episode better. we're just about to film in about 15 minutes' time. Um, so, guys, we will see you on New Year's Eve. Lots of love and stay, fa- stay, stay safe, even. And happy Christmas. Goodbye. <laughs> stay faith. Stay faith. Keep stay the faith. faith. Keep the faith. <laughs>